we finally got here to the point where we have flowers showing up on our melons our cucumbers our squash and we've got a mix of females and males and the question becomes do you need to hand pollinate is there a benefit to hand pollination and we're going to go over just hand pollination in general that's going to include tomatoes peppers obviously squash and like the common ones you always see people doing um along with like even corn i know it sounds bizarre but we're gonna discuss what the science says that term has just been tainted as of because of what happened four years ago but anyways whether or not it's worth your time and energy so let's get into it this is gonna sound so weird but we're gonna film here and then i'm going to just like overlay what i'm talking about because it is so hot out you gingers they're not meant for this all right so i'm not gonna get into like too much of the technical terminology only because i don't think it like really matters to you guys that much but because we do science on this channel i am going to mention some stuff but i'll make it like how i usually do which is like very basic and that's what it should be the only reason science uses crazy words is because they need to justify the fact that they spent their life saving savings on some letters behind their name. What is it? How is it done? So the way you have plants, S-E-X, the process of hand pollination. There's two different kinds of flowers out there. There's perfect and there's imperfect flowers. So a perfect flower is a flower that has both the male and the female portions of the plant or the flower in the same flower. A lot of physical flowers are this. Uh, tomatoes, peppers are all examples of perfect flowers. So they have the pistil, which is the female reproduction size. So there's kind of like an ovary and that sort of thing, an opening, very similar to the rest of mother nature's anatomy on other creatures out there um, and then there is the stamen so that is the male side of things and that usually includes and it does include uh, the anther the filament um, just in general the pollen that sort of thing so these are usually pretty visually obvious um, as to which one's which and when you kind of like deconstruct a, a perfect flower like for example a lily is a great example of this it has it's very obvious where the female parts are and the male parts other times you can have perfect closed flowers such as in the case of tomatoes and so this is a, a flower that is completely encased wheat is another example that's completely encased very little pollen gets in very little pollen gets out it's 90 something percent self-pollinated and things like the wind actually is what helps with the pollination process so that's how perfect flowers work now we'll talk about how you actually can or self-pollinate with tomatoes and perfect flowers to increase yields and all that sort of stuff here in a little bit but the other option is actually imperfect flowers so imperfect flowers is when a plant has both male and female flowers so the male flowers obviously can have everything that has to do with the stamen and then the female flower has everything that has to do with the pistil the downfall of plants like this is that they tend to rely completely on pollinators and or uh, some sort of mechanism in which the pollen is spread so corn is an imperfect flower and is a great example of this because it completely relies on proximity to other corn and wind so that's an example of an imperfect flower that's heavily reliant on how you plant it and then what it's exposed to uh, climate wise. Whereas like a pumpkin or a cucumber is completely reliant on, unless you intervene, on pollinators. The question becomes like, is it worth your time and your effort to do this? Well, it's actually, this is kind of cool. Some cool stuff came out of my research for this. Here are things to watch out for inside of your garden that actually indicate that you have poor or Im improper pollination, not correct levels of pollination uh, in your plants. And there's some very obvious signs we see. So number one is like the actual physical fruits dropping off. We see this all the time, uh, particularly the, the flowers falling off or in the case of like the melons and the squash, usually the whole female flower will pop off. 
that's maybe very likely something that hasn't been fertilized. Um, the other one is actually, if you ever see cucumbers, I see this with cucumbers probably the most, maybe zucchini every once in a while, but that one's pretty rare, um, where it looks really full at one end and then it kind of like tapers off into like this little skinny thing. Well, every single seed inside of there was a female organ and the female organ needed a male organ to, or male pollen um, to kind of make that seed, if you will. So what happens is if not all of the female organs inside of that flower were pollinated, you end up with like a lopsided cucumber improperly pollinated. So that's another sign that you didn't have proper pollination. And then the other one you can see, and it's like, this one's a little bit rare. I've never really seen this one too, too often, but a hollow heart is what it's called or a hollow fruit so the inside of the fruit is completely hollow there's nothing inside i don't i've i've personally never seen that in my garden i've never really seen it like in person to be perfectly honest um i think that one's pretty pretty rare that it would be that extreme okay so if we know that poor pollination can obviously affect our yields it can cause our flowers to drop it can cause fruits that look a little bit odd uh, completely edible but just like oddly shaped and or not the tastiest we can understand why it may be important to ensure that pollination is happening properly but before we just jump in and say okay we need to hand pollinate obviously that's the solution we need to actually look at what causes poor pollination and if we can just up the ante in our gardens naturally by mitigating some of the things that disrupt or harm the process of pollination so number one is the pollinators themselves so i'm going to insert some footage but there are so many different pollinators in my garden there are ants there are bumblebees there are flies i've seen hummingbirds there my dogs technically probably are pollinators to an extent as well all of these things uh aid in pollination now the reason why i say diversity in pollinators is key and important is because every pollinator actually serves a different purpose in their body structure and how big they are so an ant for example isn't going to be able to carry as much pollen as say a bumblebee would be able to because a bumblebee is a much bigger animal um, it has all those little you know hairs on it that pick up the pollen so for something like a a giant pumpkin where you got the big flowers lots of like powdery pollen inside it makes sense for those to be the pollinators for squash and that ants probably wouldn't be the best result for like smaller flowers like cucumbers they maybe have like slightly smaller flowers something like an ant actually is probably better because it's more likely to kind of get into the flower get the pollen out and then put it in a, in a new space so the actual pollinators themselves and the diversity of them is important and that's maybe why you may want to reconsider like the use of diatomaceous earth or just organic herbicides or pesticides in general um because you are gonna destroy your diversity just because it's safe for bees doesn't mean it's safe for everything and organic pesticides in particular tend to be pretty unbiased in what they take out unfortunately okay so the next one is actually us and what we do in the garden so there are a few things that you as a gardener can kind of screw up so number one is actually not planting the proper plants together and or having proper plants just in and around the vicinity so sometimes you need for certain species of shrubbery uh berries a lot of berries out there tend to fall into this category you need a male and a female plant apples usually pears that sort of thing so many times you'll need an um sometimes you'll need a male and a female plant so that's where kind of having like diversity in your plants that are in your garden and knowing if you have a male or a female plant that sort of thing now the other one is actually in the event that you don't plant things close enough together and this isn't super often that this happens but it can and corn is actually like the number one that you'll see this with and so that one is one of those it's really hard to grow corn in an urban environment i'm trying it this year just to give you guys kind of like an idea of how to do it and then my corn's not really germinated properly so i don't really know how it's going to turn out to begin with but the idea here is that you plant them close together like pretty darn close together and then you have a lot of them so that they are able to kind of pollinate with the wind moving the 
the pollen around in like their small space. And so with that one, with corn in particular, there's no, like there's no fix to that. There's no level of hand pollination that's gonna make that work. Um, and cause you're completely relying on proximity. Now there are three things that actually affect pollination in regards to like mother nature. Number one is wind. Wind actually helps with pollination in regards to like tomatoes and peppers and perfect flowers. And I did a video on vibrating tomato flowers and um, you know, whether or not it's worth your time. Wind for the most part is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you when it comes to tomatoes and wheat and all that sort of stuff. So. You're probably just gonna hear my dog panting this entire time. That's how hot it is outside. Pretty much anything that needs the proximity factor and or is a perfect flower is going to need some sort of mechanical manipulation via wind. So if you have your plants in an incredibly sheltered space, might make sense to actually vibrate your tomatoes, which is insane, but it can make be a make it or break it difference. Um, the other one is actually the moisture levels so if it's too dry you tend to get poor pollination and if it's too wet you tend to get poor pollination this one you can't fix and you would have to intervene if that was the case um and that just actually comes down to the pollen and how it's moving around so if the pollen's like mega dry or the plant in general is mega dry it's pretty obvious as to why that's not going to work out and then if it's mega wet well Kind of makes sense why it's not going to work out because it's not going to be able to it's not it's light fluffy cell the last reason why you would hand pollinate and or uh, you'd have poor pollination is in an indoor setting so if you grow indoors um if you grow in a greenhouse anything like that you're going to need to hand pollinate uh, particularly absolutely have to do imperfect flowers perfect flowers Again, you can get away with not ripping the flower apart and like doing full-blown breeding, um, which is actually what I used to do with uh, hybrids of wheat. But anyways, um, you actually actually you have to actually like go into the physical flower and remove the covering, and then you get like the male and the female portion. You pull off all the male, leaving the female, and then you like introduce the new male that you want to breed. You can actually make like crosses in your own garden between tomatoes if you wanted to using that. Let me know if you want a video on that actually, cause that might be kind of cool to do. You guys might actually enjoy that, how to make your own crosses. Okay, so the reason why growers on a large scale, um, production level scale, do this actually comes down to the fact that they're looking for fruits that are uniform and have a specific look to them. Cause remember improper or partial pollination will result in kind of like a, an oddly shaped cucumber. It can result in the, the drop of fruit. So that's the other reason. And then genetics. So like I said, uh, we, there's different breeding programs. People want to make hybrids, that sort of thing. And that's another way or another reason in which people do do self pollination. Do do self pollination. I just sneezed like hard. I'm, this is so funny for someone working in agriculture and uh, has to deal with farms all the time. I am horribly allergic to canola as well. And like canola is like full flower right now. And I was just like kicking my ass along with the heat. Okay, so what does the end result of people who have taken the time to do self-pollination, like what, how, what did it yield for you? So the results from kind of like all the different plants, is, it's highly variable. Um, because there are so many different factors. So obviously there's the plant, there's the season itself, um, you name it. But when they've looked at this, the range of increases in yield was anywhere from 50 to 160% in one case, so random. There's a pretty big range. Now that's for full self-pollination or hand pollination. So by that for what I mean is that every time there's a fruit that you go in and you are applying the pollen to it. So that is partially probably the reason why it works out that way. You may not want to do this. If you're trying to go for like a giant pumpkin or something, you may not want to do this. Growing several giant pumpkins on one vine 
probably is not going to work out very well for you. Um, so you may only choose to do one and then actually remove the rest. So it's not always a great idea, but if you were doing it on say, uh, just a regular, you know, sugar sweet or watermelons or whatever, obviously those are all situations in which the plant would benefit from it. You'd end up getting a higher yield just because it's a, a sure thing that the pollen has done its mark. Now, several, several flowers need to be used. Now this isn't just like a one and done. This isn't a situation where you just go in one day, you pollinate all your females, you call it a day. You probably want to consider going in several times to really make sure that pollination is done properly. Um, so yeah, that one's kind of cool. The one where people like not a full pollination, but like a partial, which would have involved people who um, just went kind of in once and or just haphazardly chose to self pollinate or help uh, with pollination. Actually, that was 13% increase, which is still like an increase in yield. So I don't know. So what that simply all means is that you as a gardener need to decide if it's worth your time and effort. I personally don't do it ever. I don't have time for it and I don't really care that much. But if it's something you enjoy, that sort of thing, like go for it. Why not? It'll be fun. So is it a make it or break it? Actually, technically it could be a make it or break it, uh, particularly with your yield. If you want to check out that video on the vibrating of tomato plants, just go check that one out. It's kind of funny. It's an older video, but it's still funny. And I'll talk to you guys next time. I hope I feel better next time and I'm not stuffed up with an inch of my life. See ya.